is the, is my voice audible now okay all right okay so as i was saying we uh, we talked about uh, the different you know god is a god of covenants he keeps those covenants he's a god who establishes those covenants and he calls us to be part of the covenant right now let's go into chapter 2 we look at god's covenant names now we establish the fact that god is a god who makes covenants he's the initiator of the covenant and he wants us to be part of the covenant right and god being a covenant god he by his name who he is 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 a covenant keeper right so let's look at some of those names of god right exodus chapter 6 verse 3 to 5 I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, which is El Shaddai. But my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Right? It says, I have remembered my covenant. Now let's look at this word called Lord. I mean, uh, we use it very often, right? Yes? Right? We use it in our songs that we sing. But what is the word Lord? When we, when we translate it to Hebrew, it is, I've all, uh, you know, it is this word, yadhe vadhe, right? It, it, it is the most supreme uh, name given to a person, right? It's four letters in the Hebrew. Uh, if you check, see your notes, it's yad he. We say yod, yad he and wa he, right? But the exact pronunciation is yadhe vadhe, which means what? Jehovah. Yehovah or, ja uh, or Yahweh, right? This is the name which God chooses for himself. Uh, he says, I am the Lord. I am the God. I am the Yahweh. I am the Jehovah, right? And uh, let's go down. He's the self-existent, which means nobody created God. Right? Uh, nobody you know, fashioned him. He was there from the beginning, right? He was absolute. He is indisputable. He's unchangeable. And he's a God who is always the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, it's wonderful and it's exciting to know that as believers, you and I worship a God or we are in covenant with a God who does not change. All other covenants, you know, earthly covenants, they keep changing or they keep renewing it. But in the Bible, when God has made a covenant, it does not change. Right Now, even if you look at uh, the book of Revelations, it talks about how Israel will be the center of everything. Right Across the world, Israel will be the center. Right? And it's working towards that. Why? Because God has made a covenant with the nation of Israel. Right? So even the smallest prophecies or the smallest covenants that God has given, he has kept it. Right? So through time, God reveals himself through these names. Right? He reveals himself, who he is, what he can do, through these covenant names, right? Um, and we as his people, uh, even when you look all through the Old Testament, uh, you see God revealing himself to his prophets, to the nation of Israel, right? And even now, our God is a God who reveals himself, right? It's not like, okay, God did it in the Old Testament. He did it for Apostle Paul and people in the New Testament. It's not like he's not doing it for us now. He is doing it for us now. So every time we pray, we, may, we must understand that I'm praying to a God who hasn't changed. I'm praying to a God who keeps his covenant. And I'm praying to a God who is a God who will hear us 
and answer us because of the covenant that he has kept. Right? Look at those. Let's look at a few names. Jehovah Elohim, the eternal creator. Right? Elohim. And we see those uh, names quite a few places in the Old Testament. Jehovah Elohim, God the creator. So right now, you know, in, in our situation, we know that God created things, right? He created human beings from the dust. But didn't God create things now? Can he bring things into existence out of nothing? Yes or no? Yes, right? Uh, remember that verse in uh, Romans 3.17, he says, um, he calls those things that are not there as if they are there. So he can create. Right? He can create organs in a person's body. He can create things that you know people, uh, human beings cannot comprehend. Right? He can do things, up, you know, just 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 by saying the word. He can do it, right? And is it that God has changed? No, right? Because He is Jehovah Elohim. He's the eternal Creator. Right, God, we can pray. God, you know, I've been, I've been faithful. Lord, create an opportunity for me. God can do it. God can make something come for us. He can open a door for us, doors of opportunity. He can create opportunities for us, right? And each one of you are, you know, going to be ministering to people. Some of them come and say, hey, you know, there's, uh, there's a sickness in my body, and you know, the doctors have said. This has to be done. That has to be done. You can pray saying, God, create. Right? Create these uh, muscles or create these blood vessels that are required. Create. Right? The problem is we think it's only the doctors sometimes. Right? We know God can do it. Right? He took the, you know, the sand from the, from the earth and he put it on the blind man's eyes and said, go and wash. And he received his sight. But God can create things for us, right? So he is the Jehovah Elohim. It's not just a song that we sing. It should be reality within, right? Then Adonai Jehovah, the Lord, our sovereign or master Lord, right? The Lord, our sovereign or master Lord. When we say Adonai Jehovah, he's master. Right? What, is, what is master? A master is, 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 a, is, a, is a name given to somebody who knows all, right? Uh, highest in the ladder, right? Master, Lord, sovereign. Uh, nothing can stop him. You know, when he wants to decide something, he doesn't say, okay, 10 angels come sit, let's discuss, should we do it? He's sovereign. If he decides it, it is done. And the devil can come and try whatever he wants to try. But if he decides something, it's done. Right? That's the sovereignty of God. If he decides, for example, right? If he decides tomorrow is the rapture, it's done. Right? It's not like Satan is going to say, oh no, it can't be. I still have so much work to do. He's sovereign. He decides. Right? If he decides that tomorrow the whole day is going to be dark, uh, scientists can't come and say, no, no, it should not be dark because day is bright, night is dark. No, if God decides, he decides. You understand what I'm saying? So he's above science. He's above our natural mind. He's above our understanding. He's sovereign. Right? He is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who, everyone knows this, the Lord who provides. And he provides in supernatural way. And this, is, uh, this came up from the book of Exodus where he provided for the people. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord, is our victory banner, right? Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord, our shepherd. What a wonderful, you know, uh, yeah, look at that. It's so, it's so beautiful to just read them. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is our banner. He's fighting for us, right? 
Oh, Jehovah Rapha, the God of healer. Jehovah Shalom, the God, our peace. You know, in a world that we are living in, peace is something very, is very hard to find, right? People want peace, but they get P I E C E rather than P E A C E, right? Their life is in pieces. God is saying, in your distress, in your challenges, I will give you peace. Why? Because he is the Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. So, for example, you know, you, you are going through a difficult time in life, right? There's challenges. You go back once you join the ministry or you're serving in your church, and all of a sudden, you there's there's this challenges, right? It could be in the family, it could be within church. We have a choice. We can succumb to that challenge or succumb to that stress and all that's happening. Or we can say, God, you are my peace. Right? You are my peace. You know, many a times we go through life forgetting what God can do. Right? And it happens because we are so... Na we're, you know, sometimes when we think naturally, we behave naturally, right? the carnal mind, right? And so when we turn our attention towards who God is, we begin to understand, okay, God, you are able to do these things because this is who you are. This is what you can do. This is your covenant, right? Jehovah Sitkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Jehovah Shama, the Lord is present right? imagine that you know you're, you're praying in your room you're all alone praying in your room and you call it god you are jehovah shama the lord who is present god the creator of the heavens and the earth is hearing your prayer he's there he's present there right now we may not feel it you know, yesterday at the mentoring our people asked how do i know Oh, God is there. He's there. Why? Because that's his covenant. You may be just in a room. Sometimes you're just, you know, praying that small prayer inside. You haven't even said it out. He is there in that. He's a God who hears that. Right? How many of us have done that, right? Sometimes you just can't do anything. You say, God, help me. Right? It's just a cry from the heart. He's there. He's present in that. Right? The Lord of hosts, Jehovah, sorry, Jehovah Sabot, the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Makadeshim, the Lord, our sanctifier. What is sanctify? What is sanctify? Sorry? Cleansing? Yeah. All of us know that, no? Sanctify is the Lord who cleanses us. Like what does all through the uh, New Testament says? He sanctified us. He set us apart. Right now, in our life, we will have things that are there. there. There will be temptations. There will be challenges. But when we go to God and say, "God, these are the things that are in my life, and I need to get rid of it," He is Jehovah Makadisham, the God who sanctifies. Right. Jehovah Elion, the Lord Most High. Jehovah Hosino, the Lord our Maker. Jehovah Elohino, the Lord our God. Jehovah Eloheka, the Lord thy God. And Jehovah Elohe, the Lord my God. So you look at the, all these names. These are the covenant names of God. And you and I can use these names. In our prayer times, in our in our in times of ministry, when we're ministering to each other, it's not like you have to know the exact, you know, uh, pronunciation and all of that. But if you just know what they are, and you declare that over our lives, you know, there's a change because God will keep the covenant. It's like you know, you're you're telling God, God, I'm going through this problem, but Lord, you said no in this covenant. You said you're the God who will give me peace. You are the Jehovah Shalom. Now. Give me that peace. I want to rest in that peace. I don't want to live in stress. 
I don't want to live in fear, in doubt. I want the peace that you have promised. I didn't say I'll give, uh, you know, I didn't say anything. You have initiated the covenant. You get what I'm saying, right? You, God, have initiated the covenant. So the onus is on you. You said, if I call you and I use these covenant names, you will do it because you're a covenant keeping God. Amen? Right? So when we do this, we begin to understand you know, how we can really fellowship with God. Many a times, many a times, what, what I sometimes use you know, during my prayer times, all I do is I just declare who God is. Right? I don't start, you know, it's not about you know, bless everyone, bless them, this boy, bless every. Okay, all that is there. But who God is? God, what you've done for me, who you are in my life, right? And sometimes, you know, these, these, these declarations that we do can go on for hours. Why? Because you're just declaring who he is, what he has done. Right? God, you are Jehovah Jireh. And then every time I say that Jehovah Jireh, God, I look back, I see your faithfulness. You are Jehovah Shammah. Right? You, 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 can you picture what I'm trying to say to each one of you? Right? So all of a sudden, we, we may not, you know, we are, we, for example, we're praying 30 minutes a day. All of a sudden, you'll realize, hey, there's so much I can pray. There's so much I can thank God for all the things that he has done, all the covenants that he has kept for me, right? All the times when I called on to him, he answered me, right? And so we begin to build on that. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, and I do not change. What a wonderful, wonderful promise that is. I am the Lord, and I do not change. He is still Yahweh, the God of covenant. He is in covenant with us, and you and I, as his children, must understand how to live in that covenant. Right now, basically, what we want to accomplish in this chapter is it's not like you should know it all by heart and okay, for the test, you should get 100 on 100. It's not about that. What, what we want to achieve is God, this is your nature, these names, these, these these things that we have learned this is your nature right and you and i can use it in our life right? it's a choice right are we in covenant with god yes or no yes so we can use these names right we can use it in every season of our life right i remember you know uh, i'm sure most of you know right uh, early january i was really tired I pushed myself uh, in December, uh, you know, and January it began to show up. And remember at the conference, I was, uh, you know, just a little down. I went back home and I said, God, I know I pushed myself, but you are the Jehovah, Rafa, the God who heals. So I went back home. I wanted to sleep. I was so tired. I just said, God, you are Jehovah Rapha. I just closed my eyes. Open my eyes. It's more than an hour. I didn't realize. I, but I'm, you know, I'm tired. My body is weak. Oh, man, I touch, keep touching myself. Oh, I check my temperature. It's 103. But I was not getting sleep. After, after a while, it was, but I, I remember at that moment I'm saying, God, you are the God who keeps covenants. You know, and I woke up. I was so refreshed. There was such a peace in my heart. You know, I'm not counting. I'm not saying because of the medicine that's happened. I, I popped it, but it was more than the medicine. The medicine can heal the body, but there was such a peace in my heart. And there was such a strength in my spirit. And when I woke up in the morning, I, was, I just knew, God, you are there with me. Right? There was such a joy. And I knew there was something happening. Like my body may have been weak still, right, from the tiredness, from the fever. But my spirit, you know, I just felt like a lion that morning. I said, God, you are there. 
the God who created us, the God who heals us. And I just felt so strong in my spirit. Why? Because we can stand on these names. That's all I did. I didn't say God in the name of Jesus, in the blood of Jesus, nothing. All I said was, God, this is who you are. And this is what you can do. Right? So it's not always when we pray, when we have our personal prayers, when we're praying for people, yes, we pray in Jesus' name. We pray the blood of Jesus. But times like this, when we are weak, you use the name of God. You use his covenant names. God, this is who you said. Now, you don't have to think, oh, I don't know what is that. No, I have to open my Bible and check. It's OK. Just say it. Express it. Whatever your need is, express it. This is who you said you are. This is what you said you can do. Right? Any questions? Or we'll move into, yes. Hold on. Let me, the Lord, thy God. Yeah, so thy is us, our God, the Lord, our God. The Lord, my God is a personal thing, right? So it's, it's just that the Hebrew has two different things. It's like two different words, two different Hebrew meanings, right? Uh, so when, when prophets in the Old Covenant, they said, uh, the Lord, your God has spoken this to me. And then sometimes in those prophecies, our Lord God has promised this to us. But it's, it's the same thing. It's just, it's just bringing it very personal in some. And in some, he's blanketing the, the entire nation or, or every believer. So, OK. Right. So one of the, uh, let's go to chapter 3, understanding blood covenant. Now, one of the, and we'll talk more about this in the, the cross uh, and the blood in the next sections, but understanding the blood covenant. Now, the word covenant is a serious bond. We talked about it. A biblical, biblically, a covenant is a solemn promise, a firm, unbreakable promise, a commitment, and an agreement with each other. We talked about that. But what is a blood covenant? Right? Why is the blood covenant so powerful? Right? Even in the Old Testament, when you look at the blood covenant, it's very powerful. Right? Remember the high priest, they would take the blood, they pour it on the altar saying, OK, this is to signify the sins of Israel. Right? Once a year, he would go on. Why was that blood so important? It was just a goat, right? How did that blood become, you know, that the whole nation of Israel stops everything that they're doing and they're all, their eye is on this one high priest who is going with the blood of the goat in a small cup and pouring it there. What is so special about that blood covenant? You know, when we say blood, blood is what? Life, right? If all our blood is drained out from our body, you know, our heart is not going to work, right? The, the heart pumps blood, right? So there should be sufficient blood going into the heart. Too much blood is a problem. Less blood is a problem, right? So blood is life, right? If you, of course, we have the heart, which is the main organ, but it is the blood that supplies the heartbeat, right? God is a God who created and initiated a blood covenant with us. Now let's look at this, right? Uh, the Hebrew word covenant is, uh, which means to cut a covenant, referring to a covenant that was made by passing in between two pieces of flesh, which was the right involved in making a blood covenant between two parties. So basically, I'm I'm going to paint a picture for you now, right? So. So, for example, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, there were two people, right? Maybe two brothers. And the two brothers say, hey, until death. This is just an example, right? Just for us to understand. Until death, I will be with you. As a brother, I will support you. I will, I will stand by you. When you fall, I am there. I will provide for you. So two brothers make a covenant. Now, how do I establish this covenant? So the brothers say, OK, let's make a blood covenant. right? 
out of all the covenants, let's do the strongest covenant. So what they would do, they would take a ram or a goat or a calf, whatever. They will cut it, right? They will drain out all the blood, keep some of the blood. They will put that animal in between and they will walk around it as a significant, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a saying that this is like this animal, this that was, you know, the blood is all gone out, that is dead. I am willing to give my life for you in this covenant. Right? So you're telling this, your brother, if I have to die for your sake, I will do it. You see how strong the blood covenant is? You see, if I have to die for your sake, you live, I will die. Right? Even if you do wrong and people want to kill you, I am willing to die for you because of this blood covenant that I made. Now, do you have, you, you know, can you picture that in, our, in your minds? Right? Do you see how strong that covenant is? Now, what happens if the other brother says, hey, man, you did wrong. Why did you do that wrong? Now, there, you know, for example, right? There's, uh, other people are coming to kill the brother. What if this brother says, no, it's, uh, I can't. I don't want to die for your mistake. What is he going to do? If he runs away, he has violated and broken a blood covenant. Right? Now, this is just in natural terms. Now, look at what God did. Uh, in the blood covenant, a blood covenant is, is an agreement that involves the shedding of blood. A covenant in the highest form of covenant that can ever be made, the most powerful kind of covenant is the blood covenant. Right? When you enter into a blood covenant with someone, it is binding until death. In some cases, continuing from generation to generation to generation. Right? So it's also like, you know, these two brothers say, okay, I'll die for you. And then this other brother says, okay, I will look after your ge generation, your next family, your family and your family. Next four generations, I'll look after them. It's a blood covenant I'm making. Right? You, you see, it's a, it's a powerful covenant. A covenant between two people is the strongest bond on earth. Now let's look at what happens when you enter into a blood covenant with someone. Right? First one, your life, all that you have is available to them if they need it. All that you have. Right? Everything of you is available to them. And everything of them is available to you. Right? Second one, your love. You will do anything for them at any cost. Remember the two brothers, the example that I gave you? They will do anything for them at any cost. Right? So this other brother, if he runs away, saying, hey, you made a mistake. I don't want to take the penalty for that. What happens? He's violated the covenant. But if he stays back and says, okay, I'm with you. If we die, we die together. Right? Why? Because of the love. Right? Your love will, the love will cause you to do anything for them at any cost. Third one, your protection. You will come to aid and rescue no matter what. Right? Uh, no matter what it costs you, no matter what happens, you are always there being there for them. The blood covenant ceremony was to announce the terms or words of the covenant and then to seal or to ratify that covenant. Now, how is it sealed? How is a blood covenant sealed? In the Old Testament, the blood covenant was obviously sealed with blood. Right? There had to be a shedding of blood. Right now, you know, just just a just an example to paint the picture here. When the Israelites were, you know, uh, coming out during the Exodus, uh, they were coming out of Egypt, and God initiated all these covenants. And when the the blood covenant was established, 
you know it was it was so powerful that you know there were there were uh, when you read through the scriptures we see that people acknowledge the blood covenant as the highest form of covenant that's why once a year right, the high priest would go in over time god gave his people many many other covenants right so let's look at a few of them the blood covenant with abraham uh, let maybe one of us can read genesis chapter 15 1 through 6 genesis 15 1 through 6 online students you can also uh, you know read it if you have your notes open genesis 12 1 sorry 15 1 to 6 go ahead anybody can read Thank you. Right. We know the story, right? God called Abraham, and Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And because of that, God tells Abraham, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And I will establish this covenant, and I will ratify, mean, meaning I will seal the covenant with the blood. That means what? No matter what happens, I'm there for you, Abraham. You can be out in the desert, and there may be 10 lions around you. They will not do anything to you because I am there. You can be in the desert and people may come to kill you. Nothing will happen to you because I will be there. I'm making a blood covenant and I'm ratifying it or sealing it with blood. Right, let's see what, he, what happens after that. God established a blood covenant with Abraham. God himself passed through the sacrifice animals. If we read in, in Genesis, go ahead, let's read it. Genesis 15, 7 through 21. It's quite a long chapter, verse, but let's help, it'll help us understand. Genesis 15, 7 through 21. Or should I read it for the benefit of the online students? I'll just read it, right? Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit. Now, that is the covenant. Right, and he said, Lord God, how shall I know I will inherit it? So Abraham saying, God, you're calling me to a place, and he's saying, How Abraham's asking a genuine question, Lord, how will I know that I will inherit this land? He said to him, Bring me a three year old heifer, a three year old female goat, and a three year old ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. Then he brought all these things to him and cut them in two down in the middle and placed each piece opposite of each other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down, the carcasses came down on the carcasses, Ab Abram drove them away. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abraham, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs, and they will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge after they shall come out, of, come out with great possessions. Now as for you, right? So here, just those couple of verses God is talking about, 400 years in Egypt, right? Now he's coming back. He's saying, now, Abraham, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun came down, it was dark, 
that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed through the pieces, right? The Kenites, the Kenazites, the Kadam Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Pizites, Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites, right? All of them saw this. What happened? Let's just read that verse. Verse 17, and it came to pass when the sun came down, it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed through those pieces. This is where God established his covenant with Abraham. And let's just picture this, right? God is telling Abraham, I'll make you a father to many nations. Abraham had a simple question Are you sure? Yes, I will take you to a land, uh, a land that is flowing with milk and honey, and you will be you will be there in that land. God, how will I know that I will be there in the land? Okay, Abraham, this is how I will establish the covenant with you. You bring this heifer, three-year-old heifer, bring a ram, bring a goat, bring a turtle dove, and bring uh, birds, and you cut them. And so you're placing one this side and one the opposite side. So two pieces, right? One is this side, one is that side. And you know he's there on the mountain. I'm sure uh, now you know when we read it, we'll we understand later on how the Levitical promises are. But imagine Abraham. Say he's cut those animals and he's saying he's sitting there and said, God, now what? Try and eat or just wait? So he's waiting. And a deep sleep fell upon him, and suddenly he saw this. When the sun went down into that, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those two pieces. The sacrifices had burnt. God himself passed through those offerings and he established the blood covenant with Abraham. So I'm sure Abraham is oh, why you had to come all the way for this. You could have just told me. But God was saying, I'm establishing it because you asked me, no? How do I know? Through this. Through this blood covenant, you will know that I will do it. And you will die in an old age. And you will be a father to many nations. And he established the covenant. Let's look at the next one. Yeah. Genesis 17, talking about the circumcision, a seal, a token, or a memorial of the covenant. Let's read Genesis 17, 10 and 11. Go ahead. Genesis. Yeah. So you see the covenant first, God established a blood covenant. Then he's telling uh, Abraham, okay, Abraham, not only the blood covenant, now to as a seal, as a sign of this blood covenant, what you do is you take every male child and you circumcise them. Right now, the circumcision was only the ultimate purpose of this, you know, uh, covenant which God is making is relationship. So when a child is born, and the child is probably three years old, and they're circumcised, you're saying, God, I'm dedicating this child to you because this is your covenant child that you have given. Right? Abraham did it. Verse, uh, Genesis 18, 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Right? We see a relationship, a covenant. It's not like, you know, in this covenant, you know, God said, okay, I will walk through the, uh, you know, the, the offerings. It will it'll be a blood covenant and you do the circumcision. I'll meet you once a while. It's not so, right? Well, you do what you want. I'm just here in heaven listening, watching anything urgent. I'll come. No. God is talking and he's saying here, Genesis 18, shall I hide from Abraham uh, what I'm doing? You see that relationship that's established? Who is Abraham? 
what is what is what is so great about him but god is saying hey no 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 i made a blood covenant with him now he's my friend he, i i walked through that offering he obeyed me he has faith in me he knows that i will take him to the prom, to a land and he knows i will bless his descendant how can i hide it from him can god hide if he wants to if he he can he doesn't have to tell abraham everything but he's saying here how can i hide it because i made a blood covenant it's life for life now the problem is i am as as god i have no beginning and i have no end right i can't give my life there's no you know i i cannot die but how can i hide something i built a relationship with him what a powerful message no you know, abraham you see the importance of this blood covenant that is why later on you know when you read these uh, 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 isaiah jeremiah ezekiel why why were they so upset because these are prophets who understood what the covenant is it was not okay go, go there cut the animal okay the high priest will walk through the blood okay next next come on next covenant what do we do okay guilt offering no it was not that it was understand new this they knew hey abraham our descendants right god god walked made a covenant with him and god calls him friend remember in jesus's time the high priest come and say uh, you know about talk about abraham what did jesus say who oh, abraham was i am and what did john the baptist say god can raise up abrahams from these stones don't put your faith in your rituals put your faith in god right are we understanding the the weightiness of this covenant right abraham's test a to call the call to give all remember what's a part of a covenant life for life now 25 years god made abraham wait isaac was born the covenant child was born and when the child was grown up what did god say we all know the story right god, god says hey abraham you are my friend no yes yes god i am your friend i have given you what you asked for yes so i have fulfilled my part of the covenant i brought you to the land right i blessed you you waited 25 years but you got a child now through that child you will have generations and you will be called the father of many nations i have kept my covenant now there's something that you have to do in the part of the covenant okay abraham what is it okay take your son and go up the mountain and sacrifice him there life for life what did abraham do imagine abraham saying no 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 i'm sure he felt that god why why are you doing this but abraham knew the that I, i'm sure that picture would have been in his mind those offerings and that fire being burnt and jesus and god walking through that establishing a covenant i'm sure abraham would have thought okay it's my turn now because god has done what he said now i have to do this my part of the he may not have used the word covenant but he understood okay because god did his part now i have to do my part okay come isaac let's go right let's go up the mountain let me know the story right just before isaac is killed god says now i know that you fear god and you will keep your side of the covenant so the same way you know when god does some things for us he blesses us he provides for us he still wants us to be in covenant what does that mean not just being happy and saying okay thank you god no he wants us to do our part of the covenant to grow more like him right to do things to be obedient to his word to grow in maturity to grow in christ likeness there's a part that we have to play right so we can't say god you given me everything thank you so much yeah that's because he's kept his covenant right even when we disobey he will keep his covenant but there's something that we must do right what did abraham do abraham didn't say no god i'll 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 take i don't want any promised land i'll take isaac i'll just go away 
thank you for what you've done till now. Did he say that? He said, no, I have to keep the covenant. My turn now. So God may call us and say, hey, Paul, you know, I did this for you all these years. Now, can you do this for me? What is going to be our response? Like, what is our response going to be? He said, no, God, this is only better. You know, thank you for all that, but I, I don't think I'll be able to do this. God is saying, hey, I made a covenant with you. But you know, the wonderful part about our God is he's not going to say, you have to do it. He keeps the file open. He says, see, I've done for you. You do for me. He may call you to say, okay, can you pray one hour every day for me? Just pray one hour. Just talk to me for one hour. You have 24 hours. You sleep eight hours. You talk to me for one hour. Because I've done so much for you. Huh? Abraham, I've done so much for you. You're willing to give your son. That's good. But God, uh, you know, God may say, just give me one hour. Just talk to me. I will talk to you. You talk to me. If God is asking that, no, God, actually, it's half an hour is better. Right? Half an hour is good. And uh, uh, oh, it's too cold in the morning, or I can't do this, I can't do that. And God is saying, Hey, I've kept my part of the covenant. I'm just asking you to spend one hour. Right? Or He may ask you to, you know, do a, a, simple things, right? He's not asking for big things, go and start a big ministry, and uh, you know, 10,000 people must be saved. He may start off with the small things, right? You know. I'll just take a break, but I'll say this. You know, in Bible college, when I was in Bible college, my job was to clean the cobwebs. <laughs> you know, the place that we had to, when we were studying, it had a lot of uh, spiders, a lot of cobwebs and all. So my job was to take that long broom and walk the whole college and then sweep and mop the whole place. We were four in the team. Nobody will come. So alone, I'll be doing it. Where are they? They're covering and sleeping. It's like, God, what is this? I got really upset. And, and I remember God said, telling me, you keep your side. You watch what I will do for you. You do. Nobody's there in the hall, in the, in the Bible college. Nobody's watching you. Nobody's going to honor you. Nobody's going to say, Paul, this award is for you. Nobody's going to do that. And for two years, you're going to do this. But you see what I'm going to do for you. You keep your side of the covenant. I will keep my side of the covenant. Now, was that a big deal? Was that praying in tongues for two, three hours? No. It was all what responsibility was given, do it. Right? Fill your, keep your side. God, I'll keep my side. Okay, let's take a break. We'll come back. <laughs>